The Paul Leslie Interviews. Well, I started this morning by listening to your recording of The Shadow of Your Smile. Isn't that funny? I was just rehearsing with that yesterday because I'm doing it for a benefit, and I hope you liked it. Oh, my gosh. Well, I had the, I had the opportunity to interview the composer, mm-hmm. Johnny Mandel. Oh, and, yes, we know Johnny very well. Oh, yeah, wonderful guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to say, <laughs> I'm not allowed to editorialize on the radio, but just personally, I think that you have the best version of that song. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's made my day. I shall go through the day with a big smile on my face. That's always nice to hear. Thanks. Well, I mean it <laughs> from the heart. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, the voice you hear, that is Monica Mancini who's joining us. Hello. And Yes, she's a, a vocalist, a singer, a recording artist. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's nice to hear your voice. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think most stories are best from the beginning. What was a, a typical day like in the Mancini household growing up? You know, it's very funny because most people would think that there was, Henry was sitting at the piano, you know, in the afternoons or a cocktail hour and playing and we'd all be standing around singing. And, you know, it it was a really normal household back when we were growing up, back when we were very young, because my dad hadn't really sort of, in quotes, made it yet. So he was a staff writer at Universal, so he would get up and go to work every day. And my mom would get up and go to work every day also because she was a studio singer in the, in Los Angeles when they back in the day when they had a lot of not only radio shows, but they had a lot of variety television shows and a lot of recordings going on. So my mom would go over to CBS or to NBC and be one of the sort of staff singers on these variety shows, you know, like Danny Kaye, Judy Garland, Andy Williams, you know, all of those shows. And so it was a, we went to school. So that was our, you know, it was like anybody else. Everybody goes off to work. Then when dad got a little more successful, he began writing at home. He had the luxury of not having to go into Universal every day. And he had a home studio set up off the garage and he would work. And so those scenarios where we're all, you know, a family singing around the piano are a little, I'm not sure that's kind of what you were referring to, but that's, those days never happened. In fact, the music that we played at home was mostly back then Beatles and Rolling Stones and Beach Boys. I would not have pictured that, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this was growing up in the 60s, and that's and listen, I was a Beatle maniac, and, and when the British invasion happened, I was right along invading with them. And so we, we that was in the days when you used to go and wait for the record stores to open so you could be the first one to buy you know the new release coming out. And so we were huge music fans, but it certainly wasn't uh, listening to my dad's music all the time. That just, as a teenager, that just wasn't kind of what I was thinking about. You just mentioned the Beatles. Tell us about some of the other artists that you most enjoy. (sighs) Well, you know, the problem right now is not that it's a problem, but my because I I, my husband is uh, he used to play drums for Frank Sinatra and he's a jazz guy from way back. And we are my radio station is kind of stuck on the Sinatra, you know, seriously, Sinatra, the 60s and the 70s are my kind of like go to stations. And I so rarely listen to any new music, which is a terrible thing to admit being an artist and being a singer but I'm kind of I just love listening to that kind of stuff you know my heroes my musical heroes were you know I wasn't I love Barbara Streisand I think she's great but that wasn't who uh, women that I listened to I listened to you know Linda Ronstadt and Joni Mitchell and Laura Nero and and guys I, I was a Bobby Darren freaky fan so I listened to him all the time so I had a kind of eclectic kind of weird musical thing going on <laughs> What are the qualities that make a great singer? Oh, brother. Well, for me, when I go to hear singers, I'm I'm really hypercritical. And I, I don't mean to be, not just putting out terrible things about singers, but, but I, I really am very picky when it comes to how singers move me. It's got to be something that I hear in their voice that communicates something. You know, I know a lot of singers that have perfect pitch and that are flawless you know, technicians with their voices, which I admire too, because that's not easy to do. But if I go out and hear a singer, I want to be moved. I want, I want some sort of to know, I want to leave a show knowing who the person was more than I did when I came in. And I think through music, you can really discover a lot of things about people. 
And so it's about a, it's about a communication thing. It's, it's, you know, technically it, it is what it is, but for me, it's who can move me with their, with their interpretation. As you mentioned, both of your parents being musical, what would you say the biggest lesson from your father and your mother that you learned as a musician? Well, you know, I have a I have two other siblings and a twin sister and all of us, you know, which most kids did were had the perfunctory, you know, piano lessons and whatever. Unfortunately, in going to parochial schools growing up, there were no music programs, so we didn't have the benefit of of taking music classes in school, but my parents what I learned from them was mostly just observing them and watching them as professionals and how they operated in the world and how they related to people and and I think that if you ask anybody who worked with my dad, the first thing they would say, the music speaks for itself, but they would first and foremost say that he was one of the nicest, most generous human beings they've ever known. And so that's kind of how I try to live my life professionally and personally, just, you know, being a, you know, a decent human being for one thing. And so in terms of anything musical that they may have imparted, I just paid attention and saw how they operated in the professional world. And that's kind of how I took my lead in that regard. But they never were, you know, my parents, particularly my dad, never encouraged music one way or the other for us or any particular direction. I think they just wanted us to be, they just wanted to be good parents and they wanted to do the right thing and have their kids be productive and happy people. So I just paid attention and learned, learned from them. And I think it's paid off for me pretty well. How do you see your father's influence today? Well, I, I take it you're you're speaking out in the general world of music and yeah. And, well, you know it's kind of tough because he's you know he's been gone now for twenty two years and obviously the big hits that will never die you know it's those standards that will go on and on will will kind of permeate the musical air but. You know, it's interesting, a lot of people go back and now that they're doing all of these remixes and things, you know, Peter Gunn has sort of resurfaced over the last 10 years in in the rock and roll sphere. And people, you know, Paul McCartney played the riff, Peter Gunn riff on stage in his concerts, you know, as does Joe Walsh and, you know, kind of all these rockers. So he's definitely, you know, left his mark. And it's much less now than it was, let's say, 10 years ago or right when he passed away, because then obviously you get a spike in, in all of the playing of the music. But I think that the way I notice how he's left a mark is when I go out and do symphony concerts and, and you know, do tribute concerts of for him. People really respond to the music, even if they're, they're more obscure tunes, which I like to do, that people have never heard before. He just had a way of writing and a way of, again, communicating and he was a master of a melody, and I think people resonate with that kind of musicality. And and so I think he's left his mark in many different ways, other than just the way you, being familiar with Moon River. Oh my God, that's great! Most people, if I say today, do you know who Henry Mancini is? To a young person under 30 years old, they'll have no idea. And then when you say he's the guy that wrote the Pink Panther, then they go, Oh, you're kidding! I'm not, you know, so. Even though by name he may not be remembered for to a lot of young people, the music certainly still is. You were mentioning Seriously Sinatra, the mm-hmm. satellite radio station, earlier. And it's interesting when you think about the fact that Frank Sinatra, two of his children were singers. Well, one, mm-hmm. you know, as you know, is still is, but mm-hmm. Frank, Frank Jr. passed away recently. Yes. And then Dina Martin, also mm-hmm. a singer. You are a singer. James Torme, the son of Mel Torme. Mm-hmm. Do you think that you even have a choice? Is is being a musician almost like a destiny? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you know, it's. I think that that I had a particular asset in my my case because my dad never he couldn't sing. He had perfect pitch. He could he knows where the notes are, but the quality of his voice. He just had a terrible singing voice, and he knew it. I don't compose, I don't write, I never pretended to. So, you know, we never had this sort of, I wouldn't say competition, but we never had, we didn't do the same thing. So I didn't, people couldn't 
draw any comparisons to me or how good I was compared to my dad because we, we were a different beast. I really feel for those people who, you know, you say they were destined to be singers. I think it's an easier path for people who, who have that door open to them and they have the name and they have the, their parents were these huge superstars. I think it's, it's, it's never an easy way to go, but it certainly seems like it's the obvious place to go. And in a lot of those cases that you're speaking of, I mean, I think they're all fine singers. But again, you know, you, you look at them and look at the parents, and I, I don't think anything could compare with that. I think it, I think, I think it might be a little tougher for that for those people to go into that business because they, you know, their their critics are out there, and they're, you know, everyone's comparing you to the. I don't want to say the real thing, but the for the Dean Martin, you know. I don't know if that answered your question at all. I, I tend to go off on these tangents, but did that yeah. answer your question? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, I, I really admire people who actually that that are the child of one of these huge superstars, and then they go off and do something totally different, only because it's it's got to be so much easier. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? But yeah, for some, it's a foregone conclusion that they, you know, you grow up in that environment and you see kind of how sexy it is and you see how how you know the entertainment industry at least back then was it had romance to it and it was it was a a really cool place to be you know I don't think it's anywhere near that as much anymore that's why I feel really fortunate to have grown up then rather than be the daughter or son of someone now I, I don't know how easy that would be what is it that you most want to create with your singing well, when I did the first my first CD, which was a tribute to my dad, I had a challenge in front of me, and that was I had this big opportunity to present myself as a, as an artist because I was as as I did with as my mother did years ago. I was a studio singer before I went out into the you know solo world. I was perfectly fine with that, and uh, you, you know you go in your jeans and no makeup, and you go to the studio and hang out with your friends and do a record or do a. a television jingle or, you know, just do all this behind the scenes work. And that appealed to me very much. And it wasn't until my dad passed away that I was given an opportunity to go out and do a tribute concert of his music in the symphony world, in the pop symphony world. And it was then that I really felt the responsibility to give somebody something. I mean, I knew I could sing. I knew I had a good voice, but that's just not enough. And as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, for me, it's got to really be some kind of communication. It's got to be a something you feel from a performer. And so I took it very seriously when I went out there and, and started singing as a solo artist. And I would, especially with my dad's music, you know, Moon River, let's take Moon River, for example. Well, everybody thinks of Moon River as Andy Williams' song. I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. They put each other on the map, really. So and it's been covered by thousands of artists. And who am I to come out? Well, I know who I am. I, I had every right to come out and do it, but I, I just didn't want to give people a rehash of the same old thing. So I studied, you know, and I thought, well, what the heck does this song mean? And I wrote it down as a poem and read the lyrics and, and tried to figure out a way to make it different, having the melody be recognized by the world. In my case, I just tried it to you got to make the song your own. Okay, oh, that's such a cliche in the, you know, old American Idol world. You got you made it your own, you know. It, it doesn't really mean anything, but it's my responsibility as a as an artist and it's the only way that I can feel fulfilled is if I give something my own spin on it or just make sure that the listener is hearing something maybe that they haven't heard before or hearing a version of it that even though it's such a familiar song that maybe you pick up something from it in a, in a lyric that you hadn't thought of before. That's what happened for me for Moon River. I just I just finally got it, what it meant to me. And, and then I was able to interpret it in a way that made other people think about, oh, that's what that means. So anyway, it's, it's a challenge and it's a, it's a process and it's kind of fun to be able to take a song and, you know, not just go in the studio and say, well, well let's just get this one done. You know, you got to do something else with it. Anyway, that's the way I look at it. We're joined by vocalist and recording artist Monica Mancini. What is the greatest compliment you've received as an artist? Well, you gave me one this morning. (laughs) I mean, you know, when someone says you have the best, you know, I I think you have the best version or interpretation of, of a song, you know, as we were talking about with Moon River, if you, you know, if it's a song that is so familiar and so played and so embedded in people's minds as a particular way you hear it, and then to have someone say, wow, that's the best version I've ever heard, that does it for me. That's 
not the biggest compliment. You know, I want to, I want to, I'm not going to say move people to tears or anything, but I want to have someone, like I said, I want someone to leave a concert hall or leave a, a club after seeing me saying, wow, that was, I really, I like her. I, I know her better. I, I get her. There's a person here behind the music. And that's, that's kind of what I think you need to connect music with the people. And that's what I kind of try to do. When you take a look at your own recordings, is there a particular song that you are the most proud of? Hmm. Well, for me, the very last CD I did, and this was this was a few years ago, so I'm, I'm working on my sixth one now, but I had an opportunity for my last one to record with artists that were my musical heroes, that they were, you know, I recorded, they were the covers of my favorite singer-songwriter music from the 60s and 70s, and these were people that I wore their records out, and these were, you asked me before, these were my musical influences and my heroes. And so I did a duet with Brian Wilson, and I did a song together. Jackson Brown and I did a song together. Felix Cavallari from The Rascals, he played on one of my tunes. Stevie Wonder played harmonica for me. So those, you know, in terms of a a body of work, that was the most fun for me because I was like a fan, and I went in to the studio just giddy every day to record this music and, and to actually collaborate with, with the people that wrote the songs. I thought, oh, my God, I have died and gone to heaven. So, you know, in terms of a, a musical experience, that was kind of it for me. Did that answer? <laughs> Where did I go? She's yeah, off again. <laughs> you were talking about the experience of the I Love These Days album. Right. Oh, and the favorite, a favorite, a favorite song. You know, this is going to sound really weird, but there is a CD that I did called Cinema Paradiso, and that was kind of another tribute to my dad, although there was no music of his on that except for one song, but it's it's film music, and he clearly got me very involved in in listening to film music and, and knowing how important it is to create an entire piece of film. Without the music, it's kind of eh, and sometimes music can, can ruin a film, so it's it's a perfect marriage of cinema and music. And there's a song, and I, it's, called, it's called Too Late Now, and it's from a dumb movie with, I think, Fred Astaire back in the you know, 40s. And it was written, oh, God, now I'm, it's, it's that morning fog kind of thing. I, I forget, uh, Ler, Lerner and Lowe, but one of the, like Alan J. Lerner or something. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a classic, you know, standard song called Too Late Now. And I don't know what it is about that song, but it just kills me. Even when I hear myself doing it, I go, oh, and I, and I don't know why. It's just one of those songs that I just absolutely love. And again, it's, it's obscure, and it's probably something no one would know unless they're, you know, of, of that age. But that's kind of where my mind went when you asked the question. The other album you were mentioning, the I've Loved These Days album, mm-hmm. it starts off with These Days. Yeah. Gosh, what a song. Well, that's what I thought, and that's why you know that's why I I was you know a huge Jackson Brown. I thought he was just uh, so ahead of his time and insightful. You know, he wrote that thing when he was 16 years old, and you think of that and go, oh my God, this kid, this kid had had it going on, and he still does. So you know that that was it's a wonderful song, and it speaks so much to things that we all think about and regret, and you know. Just lots of lots of wonderful things. But that's why I love the 60s and 70s, because that music spoke to me. Those artists said stuff that we were feeling, and, and it, was, uh, it was really, really cool. I, that was an absolute highlight of my life, was recording that record. Tell us about his contribution to the track. Jackson? Yeah. Well, my engineer, most of the time, now it's my husband, because he's gone on and, you know, become a... Grammy winning engineer guy. So if he's living under the same roof, I'm going to use him. But he, um, a guy named Al Schmidt and Al Schmidt is, he's been, he's 85 years old now. And Al, I probably wouldn't want me to tell you that, but he engineered records from, he engineered the Peter Gunn. He engineered my dad's first recording of Peter Gunn. He did Moon River. He, he worked with my dad back in the day when my dad was getting started. So Al is in the studio with me, and he also recorded Jackson Brown's music when he first came out. And Phil Ramone produced that record for me, and Phil produced Jackson back in the day as well. So I had this this sort of family that was that had been immersed in that world, and so I I really felt like it was I don't know I, it was a bit surreal. But in terms of Jackson, he had worked with all these people before, so 
I said to Phil, what about getting, you know, when we first started the concept of the record, I said, let's pick the songs. And I said, well, why don't we have some of the artists? Let's reach out to some of the artists that wrote the songs and see if they'll participate. And every person I asked said yes. And it was a question of just calling them up. So I got Jackson Brown's number at his studio in Santa Monica. And I called him because I thought, why go through managers and all that kind of stuff? Nowadays, you couldn't get through to anybody. But it was very easy for me to find him. I'd never met him. And I asked him, and along Phil called as well, and, and asked if he would participate. And he said, sure. And he was a huge fan of my dad. So we started talking about some of his favorite stuff that my dad did. And so it was kind of a little love fest to, be, to, to start off with. And he was just about as gracious as anyone can be. What I found with these artists, and you know, even even um, Brian Wilson singing "God Only Knows" with me, and and other, it's that they had an opportunity to come back in and rediscover the song for themselves as well. Not, not like I was giving them this big opportunity, but you know, when you come back after all these years and go and re-record something that you did, it, you discover new things about the song and about yourself. And I found that Jackson sort of had that a bit of that going on when he was in the studio doing his, he plays, he played a lot of guitar on it and he did a background vocal with me and, you know, he was reworking the chords and doing, you know, playing it on a different guitarist to see what sound would be best. So, you know, it wasn't like he came in and just said, Oh, I'm going to just do this song again for the 9,000th time. He worked it out and he made it work with me. And that's why it was, I found it to be a collaboration rather than just calling someone and saying, Oh, would you want to do this duet? Yeah. Okay. But it, it was it was teamwork and it was it was beautiful. I loved it and I I am forever more a fan of his. He's just a really special classic songwriter and and artist and a really good good guy. What artist would you most compare yourself to? Hmm. Well, I try not to be like anybody else. You know, it's always nice when you know someone hears your voice on the radio and said, oh, that's Monica Mancini, rather than saying, oh, that's someone who sounds like somebody. I, gosh, that's a tough one. I honestly don't know. That would have to be something you or someone else would have to say because, you know, you can never look at yourself. I, I don't know how to answer that. Who would you say? Well, you tell me. <laughs> well, I think you kind of sound... You you do sound distinctly like yourself, but there's there's a kind of Streisand esque feel a little bit. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I you know I've been told that, and when people come to my concerts and then I go out and sign CDs afterwards, <laughs> I've had the damnedest thing. Someone said to me, "Oh, you so remind me of Doris Day," and I think. Okay, I don't get it, but whatever you think. And another one said there's a little bit of Ella Fitzgerald in there in terms of some of the resonance and just some the quality of her voice in a particular register. They think that I sound a bit like her. So I think that I do I do have all of those kinds of qualities. And I think that also comes from having grown up in that world where they were, you know, I was listening to those voices back back when they were really powerful and strong and, and big superstars. So I'm sure that influence has come through without even paying attention to it. You know, I used to listen. I used to, to warm up in the car when I was getting ready to do a concert or something. I'd stick in a Barbra Streisand record because it's a great way to warm up your voice because her voice is so all over the place. It was a good, it's good exercise for me to be singing along with her. So I don't doubt for a minute that I, that I might have picked up some of those inflections and some of that sound of hers, which is a huge compliment in my book. I mean, because I don't think it gets much better than Barbra Streisand. In your opinion, are artists happy people? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I just think that artists that I know and that I'm close to just need to relax. I, you know, I, I think that they, I think that we as artists, I don't so much because, as I said, my dad was one of the most easygoing, sort of let it, you know, like off a duck's back. He didn't hold grudges. He took criticism well and yet he was the ultimate professional but he just had a way of like looking at the world that was really you know don't sweat it you know let's just get on with it and do what we love to do and a lot of the friends that I have a lot of artists it's they just put a lot of pressure on themselves and and I I think a lot of it is you know you want to be the best and you want to please and you want to do all that stuff I like to only hang out I don't hang out with surround myself with downer people. <laughs> so if there are artists out there that are that you know are not particularly happy, I don't like being with them. So hmm. 
the ones that, you know, I, I surround myself, you know, Los Angeles and the Hollywood area, it's, it's pretty small. Everybody knows everybody. And we have a lot of friends in the industry and a lot of people that I love to hang out with. And I like to hang out with the with the, with the happy ones. I mean, I can't think of anything worse than artists sitting around together bemoaning the state of the industry or bemoaning this and that, because <laughs> we're all very lucky and really fortunate enough to have found a career and found a place to do this. And we have nothing to bitch about. So if there are those unhappy people out there, let them let them find each other and, you know, <laughs> and, and talk about how terrible the world is. I don't know. I just don't. It's kind of not my world. What is the best thing about being Monica Mancini? Well, I have a a perfect, perfectly wonderful, I was going to say perfect family, but no one's got a perfect family. I've got a great family who live all within, you know, 20 minutes of each other here in in L.A. I have the most wonderful husband in the world, and he thinks I'm the most wonderful wife in the world. So, you know, surrounding yourself with people who love you and who you love is kind of a great part about being me. You know, on the heels of saying that people bemoan things and, you know, bitch about things, you know, I would love to be, you know, get my next album done. And that's kind of sitting on the back burner. There are a lot of things that I would love to be to be doing that I'm not. So uh, I need to I need to get busy. (laughs) But it's pretty cool being me for me. I don't know who else (laughs) I would be. I like it. I'm pretty okay with me. I've got to be me. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) One of the great songs. Come on. Come on. Well, that brings up a good point. Mm -hmm. Who are your favorite songwriters of all time? Well, (laughs) I'm going back to the... You know, you talk about those people who have just written these massive pop hits. I dare I say my father, because there are some songs that he has written that that just kill me every time I hear them. But... You know, I'm like I said, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s and and those were those were listen, I couldn't be more of a Beatles fan than anybody in the world. And they're I love I think they're unbelievable songwriters. I thought Laura Nero was a beautiful songwriter. I think and then again I'm going back. You know, I think Barry Manilow is a great songwriter. You know, off the top of my head you know, and as you said, Leslie Brickus and Anthony Newley, I mean, they wrote some outstanding songs that are just singers' dreams. I usually look at how good a songwriter is by, by I think, as a singer, you're always looking for a great song. And, and so I always, great songwriters write great songs. So those are the people that I gravitate to when I'm looking to record something. So, you know, turn a CD over of mine and you'll see who my favorite, writers, who my favorite composers are. It's a very open-ended question. For anyone listening, what would you say to the audience? Just in general? Just like, hi? Yeah, anything me, you like. My words of wisdom? <laughs> words of wisdom, yes. You know, I think we, I find that, you know, I'm married to a political junkie. He has the, especially now because of the climate and what's going on in the world today in politics and in, in on the global sphere. And we have the TV on all the time because he can't miss a thing on all of the stations. He wants to get, he's so involved and he just loves the whole political scene. And I would say to him and anybody else, just be kind. I, you, all you see in your face are people just being awful to each other. I mean, the, in, the inhumanity of what's going on these days is, is disgusting. And it breaks my heart to see how people are treating each other in the name of politics or in the name of, in the name of whatever making America great, how, whatever you want to say. And I, and I just think that people really need to step back and say, and stop, you know, rawr, rawr, I can't stand this person. Oh, he's, and just, we're all in the same, you know, boat and we, we all breathe the same air. And I think we need to be kind, just be kind. So for my last question. Oh, I thought that was it. <laughs> no, I got one more. Okay. Who is Monica Mancini? Well, I think she is, you know, forever a work in progress. I mean, I sometimes say to myself, what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, <laughs> and I'm well grown up at this point. But, you know, I still think there are some things to, to discover about me, some work I have to do, some more mountains to climb and more records to record. And, and I just don't know that I can label myself as any one particular thing. I like to think that, that I am 
that I want to be the person that when people think of my dad and they say, and his peers, all of his peers, and I mentioned this before, say, you know, the music speaks for itself, but this was a, this was a beautiful human being. And that's what I would like people to say about me, that I really, she's really, she's really, she rubs me the right way. And you're fun to talk to. <laughs> well, I, and that's another thing. My dad had the greatest, dumbest sense of humor and, and, and I, and I think people need to lighten up. That's how I kind of like to live my life. I take I take life seriously, but but at the same time, it's not that what what's so serious. Uh, anyway, yeah. that's that's my my tip for the day. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us, Paul. It was my pleasure and uh, lovely to talk to you and your listeners. And be looking for my CD out probably at the end of this year. Ah, uh, well. I lied again. One more uh, question. Max, what, one more question. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this CD coming out. Well, it's almost done, except that I, my, because my husband is my producer and my engineer, and he's got so many projects on the in motion right now that I've kind of taken a back seat. It's myself and Dave Grusin. And for a lot of listeners, they probably, by the name, don't know Dave Grusin, but Dave wrote some of the most beautiful film scores, and, you know, to name a few on Golden Pond and The Firm and... and I have trouble trying to come up with lists, but he's a really prolific jazz jazz artist and film composer. And I called him, and he's a dear friend for years. He was a, collaborated with my dad years ago, so I've known him all my life. And I asked, I was, again, an artist seeking for wonderful material. I called him and said, do you want to do a CD together? And I said, I want it to be all of your music, and I want to have lyricists come in and write because most of his stuff is instrumental. I mean, he's written some hits, you know, from Tootsie and and from The Champ. He wrote a beautiful What Matters Most. So there are songs that he has written that are that are hit songs. But I didn't want to do those. I wanted to do take his his music and have lyricists come in and write things to them. So I had speaking of Leslie Brickus, Leslie wrote a lyric to something from The Firm. I had Janice Ian from back in the day. I think you would know who she is. Come yes. in and write a lyric. Who else wrote a lyric? A wonderful jazz singer named Lorene Feather, a lyricist. She, another name you wouldn't know, but you'd know her stuff. Anyway, so I have about five. Alan and Marilyn Bergman wrote two of them. So I have about five or six new songs that have never been heard before. So that, to me, is kind of cool when you don't. There are a few covers on there, but when you can introduce new music, that's kind of a different step for me to take, is that now I'm recording something that, I didn't write because I don't, that's not what I do, but that is new music to introduce out there. So that's, that'll be fun. So it's a slow go, but it's, but it's, it'll get there. Great. All right. Well, thanks again. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Paul. Take care. All right. You too. Okay. Bye. -bye. bye.